Okay, so I talked about, uh, I got to the present uh, uh, with my previous lecture, and now I'm going to focus on perspective uh, and what's ahead of us uh, for the future of this field. So I will recap, so I, as you notice, I'm trying to recap everything where we got to, so that you get uh, a bit of the full picture, because the reason why, I make a parenthesis, the reason why I take this kind of historical approach is that uh, what happens, uh, what we measure determines uh, which kind of experimental decision we make for the future. So in the case of GPDs, as it's so complex, uh, we need to know what's left to be done. And this determines how we define the experimental program, the setup, uh, the machines that we choose and so on. So what we have learned so far on GPDs, we have brought uh, a lot of constraints uh, on the imaginary part of H with the measurements done in class and class 12 and uh, all A as well. And this allowed us to do the tomography of the proton. We also have constraints on the real part of H mainly by the cross sections measured in uh, all A. And uh, we saw the importance of the real part of H for the extraction of the d term and the pressure of the proton. The experiments with longitudinal transfer, uh, sorry, longitudinal polarized target uh, give us uh, initial constraints on H tilde, but we have new data now just taken, which will give us uh, more uh, information. We saw how important is time-like counter scattering to extract the real part of H, the D term, and prove the universality of GPD. And uh, NDVCS, it's important to uh, get uh, the E GPD, in particular for the neutron, and also for the separation of the flavor of the GPDs. Uh, this is something that I'll come back to today. Uh, the proton DVCS on transverse target was only measured by Hermes. I, I mentioned it in the second lecture yesterday, but it's really important if we want to extract uh, E of the proton. With NDVCS, we get E of the neutron, but uh, if we want to separate the flavor, we need to combine it with E of the proton. We still know nothing about the X dependence uh, of GPDs aside from uh, model assumptions, because as I mentioned yesterday, DVCS uh, only give us uh, uh, the quantum for factors which depend on the variable Xi and T, but not on the X variable, which is integrated over. So, uh, and then from uh, DVMP, so far we had only uh, from pseudoscalar, we had a successful GPD interpretation for the transversity GPD, but for the other meson, we really don't know what's happening in the quark valence region. So we may need to go to higher Q square. So what are the perspectives for the next few years? So uh, there is the experiment on DVCS on transversely polarized proton at class 12, and there are a lot of upgrades that are being discussed here at the Jefferson lab. The upgrade in luminosity for class 12, uh, the introduction of a polarized positron beam uh, for CBUF, and also the doubling of the CBUF beam energy. And at the longer term in the future, the perspective that everybody is getting excited about is the electron ion collider. So why, uh, why do we want to measure a transverse uh, spin asymmetry? It's, uh, I forgot to put here, the dependence uh, uh, of uh, the asymmetry as a function of quantum for factor, but it's, uh, this observable has a very strong sensitivity both on H and E. So E is the one we know the least. So we need to measure this, um, um, this observable. However, it's, uh, it's a complicated uh, setup to make in, particularly, uh, in particular for class. Having a transverse target has a lot of complication. I'll come back in the next slide. So, um, we need to measure it in order to extract uh, E in particular for the U quark. And we have only data uh, from Hermes at low statistic. This experiment was approved several years ago by the PAC of Jefferson Lab and was defined a high impact experiment. I mean, the experiment that will really bring uh, uh, more knowledge uh, to the field, uh, but it was only uh, conditionally approved because of the technical uh, 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 obstacles in developing a, a transverse target for class 12. So the situation, uh, it's still challenging uh, for uh, class 12. <laughs> and um, they, it, there is an experimental uh, problem. So having a transverse target, polarized target, means that you need a magnetic field that has to point in the direction of the polarization of the target that you want, okay? 
So uh, right now, the way class 12 uh, works uh, is that you have the beam going this way and you have a solenoid magnet that creates a longitudinal field. And when I say longitudinal, it means that it goes in the direction of the beam. If you want to have a polarized target transverse to the direction of the beam, first of all, you need to get rid of the solenoid magnet. And the solenoid magnet has a very a several reasons why it's there. It's there also because it focuses the molar electrons that are produced by the beam and that would create noise in the brief chambers. So if you don't have that and you have a transverse field, you risk to spray a lot of background from the beam all over your detector. So having a, a transverse target at the, at the beam line and detector level complicates things because there's gonna be the need for what they call a chicane of magnetic fields in order to be able to allow the beam to go through in spite of the transverse field of the target. And on the other hand, technically it's difficult to produce the, uh, this polarized target. There was a project that was uh, um, in R&D stage for a lot of time uh, here at JLab was this HDI's uh, target that in the end proved not to be able to work in electron beam. It was a, t a kind of polarized target that was used for photo production with class at 6 GV. But when it was tested in a test beam with electron, the electrons were basically burning down the polarization of the target. So the, the target polarization couldn't um, hold with the radiation damage induced by the electron beam. So this project was discontinued and uh, uh, a new concept, uh, not new concept, but actually a concept that is already used in the other uh, polarized target experiment here at JLab, which is the dynamically polarized NH3, has been brought up as an alternative uh, for the transverse target of class 12. But uh, there are, uh, so it's a good technology that is well known and mastered here by the target group at JLab, but uh, there are some um, problems in particular, uh, the magnet that uh, is going to use, uh, is going to be used, uh, is going to uh, kind of limit uh, the acceptance uh, for the particles that we can have. In particular, it's going to prevent uh, the use of the central detector of class 12, where the recoil proton of the VCS can be measured. And here comes the hero that uh, is behind there. Uh, so I wanted to embarrass people. So. Um, basically, in order to understand if this experiment can run, we need to see if DVCS uh, uh, can be measured even with this limited acceptance, in particular without detecting the recoil proton. So what uh, Juan Sebastian is doing is trying to see if uh, applying machine learning techniques, uh, the background the separation from the signal can be achieved even in the E gamma uh, detection topology. And uh, there are also uh, R&D studies uh, on different uh, possible solutions for uh, target and the magnet. So this, ex this experiment is really, from my point of view, the missing piece uh, for uh, the to have the full picture, at least for proton DVCS. So Juan Sebastian, your work is very precious and everybody's looking forward to your results. And, um, Another thing that uh, uh, is missing, uh, if you think about my summary at the beginning, I said that uh, we still don't know anything about the X dependence of the GPDs, because in DVCS, this X dependence is integrated over. So there is another uh, channel uh, that can be used to, uh, to circumvent this problem. And this channel is the double DVCS. Double DVCS means that you have the same thing, the, you, you have the virtual photon both at the initial and the final state. So your scattered electron uh, produces the virtual photon coupling to the quark. And when it radiates, it radiates a virtual photon that then decays in a pair of leptons. So with the fact that there is this extra Q square variable added in a final state, it allows to extract the dependence on X and so basically, when you have this, uh, this um, figure here showing what we access with the VCS asymmetry or cross-section, double DVCS would allow us to cover all this region here in the middle, so all that. So uh, it's an interesting channel from this point of view, 
but it's also very challenging experimentally. So again, it has a cross section that is uh, smaller than the one of DVCS. And we need to detect muons in the final state because um, uh, if you want to do it, there is also the option of the decay in an electron pair, but then you would have the problem of distinguish which is the scattered electron, which is the, um, the, the decay electron. And there she comes. Why is the cross section? So, yeah. you know? no. um, the energy of the scattered electron will be way more than the energy of this electron pair, right? It may be uh, overlapping. I mean, uh, so you cannot really tell which one is which. And uh, oof. Oh, how do I do it? Ah, I shouldn't go there. Okay, sorry. Even I like to the, be close. To. Even in the detector, do you want to be separated by the name? I mean, they are separated. You can detect as many electrons as you want. But then how do you say this is the scattered electron and this is the, the decay, uh, decay one? Okay. So the opening angle of the two could be whatever. It's uh, it's not uh, really something you can solve uh, uh, experimentally. But with muons uh, in the decay, you are sure. I mean, the initial state, uh, sorry, the scattered electron is an electron. The decay of the virtual photon in final state is with muons. So with muons, you would be okay. The problem is that uh, uh, class uh, 12 doesn't have a muon detector as it is. So this is the, the main uh, complication. Well, but muons travel transverse all detectors. So you, you, can put, you can put an absorber and this sort of stuff that absorb the, the, and I'll talk about it in the next, okay. next slide. There you go. So, yeah, so there are, uh, uh, because here we are talking about upgrades uh, and uh, there is uh, a project uh, of upgrading class 12 uh, in order to be able to measure double DVCS uh, uh, as well as JPSI with the mu, mu plus mu minus uh, channel. So the idea here is to have uh, an increase of uh, uh, the luminosity of the detector by two orders of magnitude. And this would allow to sample the smaller cross sections that you get with double DVCS. And so there are a lot of technical uh, changes that are planned to be done. And I'm not gonna go in the detail of all this. There is a letter of intent that was uh, submitted uh, to the PAC a few years ago. And that there is also a similar project that is being uh, defined uh, for the solid uh, project that uh, is uh, a future detector that should be um, constructed for all A. And uh, so the double DVCS, in my opinion, uh, would be really the measurement uh, to do if we want to get uh, more uh, model independent uh, information about uh, uh, GPDs. And then uh, there is the other project uh, that it's a more uh, long-term project because it involves uh, an upgrade and a modification of uh, the CBAF accelerator. It's the development of a polarized positron beam. The way CBAF works now is polarized electrons. So, uh, there are several uh, uh, physics cases uh, that uh, uh, push for the need of such uh, a facility at uh, CBAF. So there are different physics uh, that can be done, uh, but uh, GPDs uh, are part of this uh, uh, overall uh, project. So there was uh, a, a paper that was uh, out, uh, was more than a paper, was a collection, a topical issue, a full issue of uh, European Physics Journal A that came out uh, outlining the whole experimental program that could be done if we had the positron beam at JLab. And there was a lot of people and my group was involved in that uh, as well. And in particular, when it comes to GPDs, there were two uh, proposals for the VCS that were submitted a couple of PACs ago here at JLab, and now they have been uh, resubmitted now after having been conditionally approved before. The conditionally approval, uh, it's something that the PAC does uh, whenever uh, uh, it means basically we are very interested in the physics project, but there is no positron beam yet. So uh, come back when uh, things are uh, developing more uh, from the technical point of view. So there had been uh, an experiment uh, making uh, uh, the proof of feasibility of having a polarized positron beam. And this was done 
a few years ago. And after that, there has been a lot of R&D that is uh, ongoing to try to uh, implement uh, this concept uh, and uh, have it uh, really uh, at, uh, high, at the current that we need uh, for uh, to run experiment at JLab. So there is, um, there is a bit of uh, confusion as far as the timeline. This project has been uh, getting more and more support from uh, JLab management, which is something that is very good uh, for us. On the other hand, from the scheduling point of view, it seems like uh, it's uh, going to happen not, uh, not right away. So there can be a few years and it may be approaching the time that the EIC will start. So this can create some uh, problem of deciding where to go. But there are a lot of discussions uh, at Jefferson Lab right now. So I just wanted to show you why uh, for DVCS we want to have a, a positron beam. Um, the, I mentioned, I don't remember, I don't know if you remember it yesterday, um, that Hermes was the only experiment that measured beam charge asymmetry using the difference between uh, uh, DVCS with positrons and electrons. And this observable uh, showed to have a strong sensitivity to the real part of age which again we need for the D-term, for the forces and so on. So um, basically the idea here is to have positron beams here and uh, to measure different kind of uh, beam charge asymmetry combining or not combining the polarization of uh, uh, the beam. So basically uh, you get observables that are connected to different combinations of parts of the cross-section and there is a strong sensitivity to the real part of age, uh, there was uh, uh, there were proposals uh, and letter of intents both uh, uh, for proton and neutron DVCS using polarized positron beam at class. Here there is a, a figure showing um, model predictions uh, for different models uh, for uh, these these asymmetries, and uh, um, the, the 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 impact. Uh, of this uh, this kind of the this kind of measurement, if you do uh, GPD fits uh, to the projection of the observables that we could measure, they show that uh, it impacts uh, a lot uh, the uncertainties uh, on the real part of the GPDH. And I've done uh, a similar exercise uh, looking at uh, neutron DVCS, which is my favorite <laughs> measurement, as you may be figured by now. And uh, the beam charge asymmetry uh, for neutron DVCS uh, has a strong impact on the uh, extraction of the real part of E, which we, we don't have uh, much constraints so far on. So, um, so this is uh, a channel that would be potentially really interesting to measure, but it will need this positron beam at Jefferson Lab. So then there, is, uh, there are talks about uh, a 22 GV upgrade uh, for Jefferson Lab, which basically would mean from uh, the DVCS point of view, you see a plot here showing the Q square versus X distribution. The red is the coverage that we have right now. So you see we arrive up to Q squares of about 8 GV for X equal 0.5. If we where to go at 22 GV, we would reach uh, Q squares of about uh, 15 GVs. So there are um, several uh, advantages and not uh, only advantages. I mean, personally, I am not uh, hugely convinced uh, about uh, the progress that we would get in DVCS uh, going at uh, such Q squares because the cross section drops uh, as a function of Q square. And so it would be more and more challenging. So there has to be necessarily an associated improvement in the luminosity, uh, sorry, in the, uh, yes, in the luminosity that the detector can get uh, so that you can measure the smaller cross sections. But uh, it was pointed out that um, this is something I didn't go in detail much in, uh, at the beginning, but uh, if we want to apply the handbag uh, uh, leading twist and uh, leading order uh, diagram, we need to have uh, the T transverse momentum, a transferred momentum to the proton has to be smaller than Q square. So Q square has to be high enough that you have a small ratio of T over Q square. And basically, if we go to higher energy, you can get that, uh, you can reach higher T and still have this limit uh, to hold. And this is interesting if you want to get a good coverage of this uh, 
distribution of the radial pressure uh, that uh, is connected via uh, Fourier transform to the variable T. So what is said is that we need 22 GV to cover a sufficient range in T for the extraction of the mechanical properties of, um, uh, of the proton. I think that the real motivation for the 22 GV is beyond the DVCS, but is more in DVMP, which is the place where we said that we still don't know what happens when we are at low W and low Q square. So if we go at higher Q square, we may find ourselves in a, still in the valence regime. So that's where we don't know what's going on yet, but with sufficiently IQ square that maybe the handbag diagram could be applied. So going, this seems to me like the only um, channel, the only part of the GPD program, which would really strongly benefit from an increase um, in energy. On the other hand, at the longest term future, I guess some of you must be involved in it. Uh, there is the electron ion collider that is supposed to come. I think uh, the expected date is roughly 2034 or something like that, which is fine for your age. It's getting a bit distant for me, but, uh, uh, but you are the future. So EIC is not only about uh, GPDs and nuclear structure, but there is way more. Um, in the in the physics that can be done. Uh, so in particular, one of the main motivations uh, for uh, the EIC is to study saturation. So basically, as you as I showed you uh, in the first, I think, lecture, there was this uh, different uh, PDFs for the partons and you have the gluons that have uh, uh, a distribution that uh, goes uh, in increases uh, indefinitely with decreasing X. So uh, what um, needs to be understood is, uh, is there at some point, some stop, some moment in which this rise stops, uh, some sort of uh, saturation that happens uh, with gluon uh, uh, matter. So this is something that can be explored by going at lower X uh, uh, by the use of the collider. So another of the purposes, of course, is understanding the partonic structure of nuclear nuclei, which is the goal of the measurement of exclusive reaction that we're talking about now. So understand the spin of the mass of the nucleon, how they emerge from the dynamics of the constituents, do our beloved um, uh, tomography, uh, in this case, looking at C quarks and gluons, while here at Jefferson Lab, we are mainly focused to the valence region trying to understand the contribution of the orbital momentum to the spin and so on. And then there are also studying hadronization and the nucleon nucleon force uh, and, uh, and many other physics case can be done at, um, at uh, Jefferson lab, sorry, at, at the EIC. So, uh, okay, here just remind, reminding, but uh, we talked about it also at the beginning, why it's good to have uh, an electron as a probe, so why do we want an electron ion collider? If we have a hadron-hadron collision, both the probe and the target have a complex structure. So uh, it, there are this soft uh, interaction before the collision, the factorization is difficult to apply and the termination of the kinematics is complicated. While if we have a point-like probe without an internal structure, it really probes the structure of the target. So uh, this is why it's important to have uh, an electron uh, hadron collider. So we need the EIC with high luminosity, different kinds of uh, uh, beam, uh, um, beam, a hadron beam and different polarization covering a wide kinematic so that we can explore uh, the, uh, the gluon dominated region and uh, the sick works as well and understand uh, QCD. So as far as uh, the ex exclusive reaction measurements that we can do with the EIC, so we could still think about uh, measuring the VCS, and then we can have the measurements at ve of vector mesons, such as the JPSI uh, exclusive photoproduction, uh, sorry, electroproduction, which will tell us more. It's, uh, it's um, a process for which uh, the only possible diagram in terms of GPDs involves uh, gluon exchange. So with this um, uh, 
uh, reaction measured at the EIC. There have been some uh, projections made, uh, and this is the kind of uh, distributions that we could have uh, um, doing a tomography uh, by using the GPDs of the gluon that would be extracted with the measurement of this uh, final state. So um, there are different, as I said at the beginning, different uh, physics goals for the EIC, and each physics goal has a different requirements in terms of luminosity and the energy. So the kind of physics that we want to do with the GPD is the one that really pushes the requirements in terms of luminosity for the EIC. So as we want exclusive final state, uh, the cross section is small and uh, uh, we need to be at high luminosity. So this is one of the challenges that I see for the EIC to carry out uh, the, the physics that we plan to do to understand the nuclear structure. From the point of view of the kinematic uh, reach for DVCS, you see here a distribution of X uh, versus Q square. And uh, with, the, with Jefferson Lab, we are here right now. And uh, 12 GV is the, the grid here. And the compass covers the green uh, grid, so going towards uh, smaller X, so more in the C and gluon region. And then you have uh, uh, the EIC for different uh, values of the center of mass energy where we would be measuring. So you see mainly the EIC goes at very, very, very low X where we said we have the dominance of the, of the C quarks and the gluon. So uh, a few years ago, there was a, uh, still a debate whether the EIC would be placed here at Jefferson Lab or at Brookhaven. And uh, the final decision was made that the EIC will be at VNL. And basically, it will be reusing part of the existing accelerator that is RIC, and will be the addition of uh, electron storage ring. And uh, this uh, setup will provide highly polarized electron and proton and ions beam with the center of mass energy between 20 and 100 GV and uh, luminosity between 10 to the 33 and 10 to the 34. And this tells you why I was saying that it's challenging to do the measurements that we need to do for uh, uh, exclusive reactions and uh, uh, GPDs. So there is a polarized electron source, uh, injector linear, and uh, uh, in principle, the accelerator could allow to have two interaction points to place two different detectors. Although right now uh, the main project is to have uh, one single detector. And the status of the project uh, on the DOE level, uh, there are all these milestones that you have, have to go through that are the critical decision of the DOE. So there have been already critical decisions zero and one, uh, which basically are further levels of approval uh, to give more certainty that the project is going to happen. And the site has been chosen. There are a lot of activities ongoing. There has been a white paper. And the detector was finally decided. And uh, the facility completion, as I said, is in roughly uh, 10 years uh, from now. So the detector of the EIC, the requirements are here, you see. The, um, the hadron beam comes this way and the electron beam comes this way. There is the collision here and you have a, a distribution, a angular distribution and different positioning for the detectors. There's going to, I mean, this is going to be a detector uh, similar to the kind of detector you see at CERN. So like a particle physics uh, detector, uh, latest um, uh, high tech. <laughs> uh, uh, setups. So there's going to be a vertex uh, detector, central tracker, electron, hadron, and cap uh, trackers, uh, and PID is going to be done by combination of rich uh, and uh, high resolution detectors, uh, calorimeters, both for electromagnetic um, showers and the hadron calorimeter. And then uh, there are a lot of developments ongoing for the DIQ readout. And uh, there are also forward, very forward and backward uh, detector. I will come back on that um, after. So the detector concept uh, that was uh, chosen was this uh, 
EPIC detector, uh, which is called detector one. There are still discussions ongoing for uh, a second detector, and there are groups uh, that are um, that are discussing on that, but this is the detector concept that came out. As you see here, depending on the colors, there are hadronic calorimeters. There is a solenoid field in the center. First, it was said that for the solenoid, uh, they would recover a magnet from Babar, I think, but uh, I presume that lately they have been changing the plans and the plans is to have a brand new uh, magnet that is going to be built for that. And there is a set of detectors uh, in which I'm not going to go in details for to provide tracking, PID, and calorimeters. So uh, just to come to our interest, that is the measurement of exclusive reactions uh, and, and in particular DVCS. So if we want to measure uh, DVCS, uh, the kinematics are peculiar. We are going to have uh, an electron and a photon emitted uh, at low angles uh, in this direction and a proton going at very, very low angles in the other direction. So uh, in order to allow um, this sort of measurement uh, in my team, there is an intensive R&D work ongoing, both uh, at the level of uh, the calorimeter that will allow to detect uh, the electron and the photon, the electromagnetic calorimeter. And you see here, again, the future uh, famous scientist, Noemi, who is also working as half part of her PhD on the R&D for the readout of the PW4 calorimeter, lead tungstate calorimeter for the electromagnetic end cap. And, um, and in my group, there is also work uh, for uh, the very forward detectors that will uh, allow uh, to detect the protons. In particular, there is work ongoing for the readout. So I uh, just wanted to advertise the project that are ongoing in my group. I want to make a global summary of everything now because um, this is basically the last uh, lecture properly uh, defined. Tomorrow, I want to make a tutorial on uh, experimental uh, techniques because I talked a lot on uh, cross-sections and asymmetries, and I want to give an idea of how you measure them, because that's what you guys may have to do in your career, more than just think about the physical interpretation. But um, what I wanted to convey, I hope uh, you understood, is that uh, generalized pattern distribution are a unique uh, way to understand the structure of the nucleon. They allow us to do this three-dimensional imaging of the nucleon correlating the transverse position and the longitudinal momentum of the partons. They can give us uh, information on the orbital angular momentum carried by the quarks and its contribution to the total spin of the nucleon. And also get, giving us information about the pressure distribution in the nucleon. So what um, uh, has happened is that with the progress on the experimental side, the amount of data that started to come triggered uh, intensive work on the theory level to extract uh, in a model independent way GPDs from the VCS uh, observables. So uh, this extraction GPDs allowed us to make the tomographic uh, picture of the proton. And now uh, we are, the present is that uh, with Jefferson Lab at 12GV, it's really the optimal place where to keep on uh, um, exploring GPDs in the valence region. And there are several experiments that have been done and are ongoing to measure DVCS and DVMP uh, in, the three, in three out of four holes uh, at Jefferson Lab to extract uh, spatial densities of the quarks, flavor separation of the GPDs and the quark angular momentum. And uh, there are several upgrades perspective. There is the possibility of positron beam, increasing the luminosity and the energy at JLab. And this paves the road to complete the GPD program in the valence region. And if we want to look uh, at the gluons and C quarks, uh, the, the plan is to go to the EIC and try to do that. So this is, uh, this ends my fourth lecture. Thank you. Bit early. Yeah. Ooh, watch out. Okay, what now we it? have plenty of time for questions. So please. Small stairs to the. Oh, you can also, <laughs> you know? <laughs>
yes, here he is. What? I repeat quest. I go to him so he can. Uh, can I pass under that uh, or it's gonna whistle? Let's see. For uh, for the EAC, is there a reason they don't have a new one like our new new detector? Ah. Uh, you for that. Yeah. Is there a reason they're not? And they're they're only they're only gonna have a single detector. Not like that's the plan. Why would why would they? Oh. Here we go. Why would they exclude yours? No. I don't know why they would exclude that. Uh, I I don't know. Uh, yeah, right. well, you would you would need the shielding at some place and the detector beyond the shielding to detect uh, the muons. And I guess this is not part of the base design of the EAC right now, of Epic right now. Okay. Detection of muons in the EIC. We can have our EIC expert talk about that. Muon detection. Yes, the question. Yes. I, I'm not sure, but the only thing I know is that uh, the space for the detector is super tight. Mm. So I think adding any extra thing, like already fitting all of that, is super complicated. Yeah. I'm not sure if they even have space for a muon detector, but I'm not sure. Questions. Sorry, I heard that. <laughs> I speak too loud already. Don't wake them up. Yeah. <laughs> Zoom. People on Zoom. Oh yeah, people on Zoom. There is one thing on no, the chat. No, this is myself. Oh, no. okay, <laughs> Asking them to make questions. I don't know if they could follow really as well as here on Zoom. It's always frustrating to do these sort of things on Zoom. I'm sorry for them. Wait. We can also discuss tomorrow with a tutorial that oh, yes. hopefully will uh, get some more people engaged. No. So you mentioned that the EIC would only be able to um, access low uh, Bjorken X. Yes. Is it related to the fact that you uh, basically like colliding your parton and your lepton at a very high Q square? Yeah. Well, it's the collider kinematics that covers uh, lower X. It's, it's a kinematics thing. So that's how it is. By um, the valence, uh, it's here. I mean, here is the place for the valence. Fixed target allows you to cover valence uh, X uh, and colliders are always at lower X. It's a, it's a, it comes from kinematics. Okay, I see. Okay. Oh, there she is. What's your name, by the way? Atira. Atira. Okay. Nice. Um, I don't know. Yeah. Well, I mean, people on Zoom. People on Zoom won't fine. hear you. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, I uh, the the previous process that you said that you're really interested about the DD. Yeah. Um, that's going to be. After you upgrade that, right? No, that uh, is independent because for that, and I'm happy you asked me this because I like that. Uh, sorry, where is the thingy? I go back this way. Because for that, uh, what we need, it's, um, it's an upgrade only at the detector level. Uh, where did I put it? Yeah, yes, here. So we can, we have never measured it. So the current energy, 12 GV is, is fine for measuring this, but we need to revamp the detector. So if we wanna measure it, we need the muon detector of which he was talking about before, which we don't have in the current class 12. And we need to increase the luminosity and to increase the luminosity right now, the limiting factor of uh, class 12 is the drift chambers that they cannot run at too high uh, current because they get uh, noise. Uh, so you have to change the tracking system and you need to, to include a muon detector. So. At the same time, it will be a different, a completely different setup, which may not allow measurements of other final states. So it's a decision that uh, implies a complete change of the detector, but for a reaction that has strong potential. So I think it's worth it. But uh, it's something that has been already, I mean, there is a R&D going for the tracking. So it's not, uh, 
it's not something linked to the major management decision of the lab. It's happening really at the detector level. So I think it's of all the upgrades is the one that should happen more. <laughs> yeah. I would say so. I would hope so. I would hope that this could happen around 28 or so. I mean, hopefully. The EIC, I mean, the EIC is 2034, but that's for the start, you know, taking data commissioning and so on. So I wouldn't expect the data to come out before 36 or 37, <laughs> frankly. No, I mean, knowing how things go uh, with this stuff, you have a date and then it starts to slip. So I think it's very important that JLab provides uh, uh, an alternative uh, short-term plan, because uh, students like you cannot just work on something that has not happened yet. You need the data to work on. I mean, I, I, I don't like to give only simulations <laughs> to students to do. You need to have real data, and you can get interest in physics here at JLab. So you can already do it with the JLab not upgrade. There are a lot of experiments about to come even without upgrade. This is among the upgrades is one of the most interesting for GPDs, I would say, because it's never been measured and gives more information. Thank you. Well, we don't have any more questions. But we can have a tutorial yeah. tomorrow oh, yeah. with a tutorial. Hopefully we'll have more uh, exchanges, more kind of low level experimental stuff. So the theorists will all be disgusted. <laughs> but uh, maybe it gives you an idea uh, because you know you see here all I showed were plots of the final result and behind there is a huge amount of works here years of work and it's usually done by students so I thought it would be nice to show at least from the perspective of what we do in class uh, what kind of work you need to do and possibilities and options and so on anyway thank you so much Thank you. And see you tomorrow.